He might actually be the most derivative one of all. I mean, Christ, the same house. Maybe so. But you forgot the first rule of surviving a stab movie. Never answer the- I'm bored. Wait! And welcome back to Horror Queers. It's a bonus mini-sode, and I'm Joe. And I'm Trace, and, um, well, I'm not going to beat around the bush, Joe. We're discussing L.A. AIDS Jabber. <laughs> this is true, yes. And, of course, folks, if you don't know what the fuck we're talking about, it's a film from 1994, which is written and directed by Drew Gaderis. And, uh, yeah, this is a sleazy exploitation film. And it's uh, patently offensive. Yeah, it's it, so uh, we had never heard about this either. This is one of those things where we got a press release because um, Visual Vengeance released a new Blu-ray of this. The first time this film has been released since it was self-distributed on VHS mm-hmm. in 1994. I'm assuming that the only way you would have seen this is if you were in L.A. when this happened. <laughs> No, I think they shopped it around to like mom and pop theater stores all around the country. So Mm. it's entirely possible you would have seen this in a little rinky dink video rental store. But if nothing else, it's got really great box art that is definitely eye catching. I I, I will say um, I I actually like this movie fine. Mm hmm. It wasn't quite as sleazy or offensive as I was no. hoping it would be, given the title of the film. Um, and everyone, just to give you, I mean, this is a Blu-ray, but this Blu-ray comes with the disclaimer. We have created the following Blu-ray using the best source materials available, which includes uh, SD tape masters. Please be advised that the audio and video quality presented is the result of the original source material. And that is basically the polite way of saying, this looks like shit for a Blu-ray. <laughs> it's supposed to look like this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is very low budget independent filmmaking. This was clearly a labor of love. It's one of those things where the movie was shot over a year on Mm -hmm. evenings and weekends whenever they could get actors together, whenever they could get locations. And yeah, this was shot on not great video equipment back in 1994. So of course, it's going to look not super great. No, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, like, I guess the premise of this film, everyone, is that a young man, uh, Jeff, played by, oh, I, I love this actually, <laughs> played by Jason Magic, and that is Magic with a J. Ooh. It sounds like a porn star name, right? It does, yes. Uh, but yeah, he he is given a diagnosis that he has tested positive for the AIDS virus, and he is so distraught, so angry, that he wants to take the world down with him, so he goes on a it was not a killing spree, but a jabbing spree mm-hmm. where he starts injecting people with his blood in L.A. Yeah. And of course, I mean, right off the bat, you notice that there's medical inaccuracies like you don't test positive for AIDS typically unless you were like really far along, like you would test positive for HIV. But yeah. In 1994, coming off the wave of the AIDS epidemic back in the 80s, Mm -hmm. it's more sensational to say, oh, okay, well, let's put AIDS in the title as opposed to LA HIV jabber or something like that. Because really, this this dude, the filmmaker, is trying to sell this movie. So obviously, he's going to go for a sensational over-the-top title. Yeah, and LA HIV or LA HIV jabber doesn't really have the same ring to it, Mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, But no, no, there is a part in this movie that where the cops tell... um, um, a sex worker to go get tested like that day and i was like it's not gonna mm-hmm. show up positive that day <laughs> she just Absolutely got not. jabbed <laughs> yeah yeah like i don't think it works that way even nowadays i think when we have rapid tests for like 12 hours later it's like you wouldn't have contracted the virus and then be able to test it 12 hours later like yeah that's too much i think the recommended window is uh three months after potential exposure wow okay yeah. and if we're not right Feel free to write us in and let us know. I mean, I only say that because I do get tested every three months. So. <laughs> um, yeah. So, Trace, uh, when we posted this, we got a lot of responses from people saying, oh, my God, that's a real thing. Mm-hmm. What is this? Oh, my God, that's really horribly offensive. And you said you didn't find it as sensational, as exploitative, as sort of over the top as you were expecting. Mm-hmm. Why is that? I think I was expecting. I, I mean, look, I'm not going to say this is a t- tasteful movie i think the movie is in poor taste just yes given the subject matter and for the record it knows it yeah oh very much so i mean yeah this is a a, a 90s exploitation film uh Mm -hmm. but it is also much more of a police procedural like 
Mm-hmm. We start about the first 20 minutes following Jeff as he gets his diagnosis. He's running around. He's just like, I'm going to do this. And he's acting with a capital A. And then, yeah, we just move on to these two cops, and it's kind of their story. They even get the – like, the woman cop, Steph, even gets her own subplot with her kid and f- husband, which I I think comes in about 10 minutes before the end of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a couple of drop storylines, and it's hard to say whether – I don't think any of them were intentional. Like, I do think they started off saying, okay, we're going to try to give this policewoman an arc. We're going to have uh, a little bit of an expose on corruption within the police department because we're doing like some kind of covert spy operation on like one of the police officers' ex wives. And none of that matters but i think the intention was oh we're gonna try to not just pad the runtime but we're going to try to make this a more conventional film with like arcs and ebbs and flows and these kinds of things and then reality sets in oh shit that one actor was fucking terrible and super unreliable so we're just gonna kill him off screen in a (laughs) car accident and bring in a new police officer (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I mean, like, I guess, yeah, I don't know what what would have made this movie more, more salacious, more sleazy, more offensive to me. But yeah, just the fact that we were focusing on the cop side of it, I was kind of like, oh, mm-hmm. it's not like this is an, an original story because we've heard the AIDS Mary and the AIDS Harry urban sure. legends, which are floating around in the 80s. So this is kind of an offshoot of that, which I'm actually a little bit surprised I didn't just call it one of those things. But, mm-hmm. you know, when you have LA AIDS jabber, it's kind of like, well, <laughs> that's your winner. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> but um, so I think it's a really interesting premise. And again, given like the, the, the fear around HIV and AIDS uh, at the time, like it makes sense. Uh, you know, we always say horror is like responsive to uh, so- social situations at the time. It makes sense that this would have come out around the same time. Yeah, I mean... When you're trying to sell your low budget film and you're thinking, what is going to make people rent my movie? What is going to make people buy my movie? You think of, okay, well, AIDS has been in the popular consciousness. It's been tabloid fodder. It's been the subject of inquiries. It's been front page news for probably at this point, mm, almost a decade. So it definitely makes sense in terms of, oh, this is eye catching. I'll be able to sell my movie. It is just fascinating to me that this is almost more subdued. Like, I really Mm -hmm. thought that this was going to go harder into uncomfortable, gross territory. Yeah. And I feel like we're, we're maybe even burying the lead here, Trace. This movie doesn't have a gay person in it. No, I was shocked by that because I actually thought that this lead was going to be a a queer man. Mm -hmm. And... I don't know if I like that or don't like that because I kind of like it in the sense that it's like, oh, hey, cool. Like, we're not, like, focusing on AIDS as a gay disease, which is very right. much the idea that was running around at the time. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of, oh, my God, do I want to say normalizing it among other communities? Uh, maybe that's a weird phrase to say. I understand the sentiment. It's basically saying if you're a straight person, it doesn't mean that you're exempt from this. It doesn't mean that if you did get it, you wouldn't have the same kind of feelings, but also... I do think it would actually have been more offensive if it Mm -hmm. had been a queer person who's then like, oh, well, I've got the thing and now I'm going out or even like like I fully expected Jeff at one point to be like, oh, I can't believe I have the gay disease. Yeah. You know, there's no slurs. There's no references. It's almost like the movie doesn't even acknowledge that queer people have been associated with the disease. And it's kind of shocking. But you're right. It also sort of normalizes it to say, hey, straight people, this can also happen to you. Yeah, and I guess maybe that's a thing, right? So I guess I don't know if I would have liked it more if we had that. However, I think I would have appreciated its sleazy offensiveness more if we went that route. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, we don't have that movie, so I don't know how I would respond to it. But I guess that's what I was expecting, yeah, when I walked into this movie. Yeah, same with me. And in a way, it almost, I think, makes it more tasteful in my eyes because Mm -hmm. I didn't have to get my back up or feel defensive or even be like, oh, God, this is so reflective of the 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 time time in which the film was made, (laughs) right? Yeah, very much so. But again, that's what I'm saying, though, is like, if you're telling me 90s sleazy exploitation movie, I'm kind of like wanting that. So it's like it would have been bad, but it also would have been good, you know? Right. Well, and we're also both sort of notoriously disinterested in police procedurals. So did you find that that like, were you bored when you were watching the movie as a result? I think there were periods when I was bored Um, because we go long stretches without Jeff in this film. Mm -hmm. 
But I actually kind of found myself warming to the Stephanie character. Okay, and who is Stephanie? So Stephanie is the female lead detective in this case. Um, I also did like our reporter, Judith, who, what's her face? Mm -hmm. Even though, (laughs) even though I think her character changes at a certain point in the film. Like, you know, we have her doing the reports and saying like, burn in hell, blah, blah, blah. But then all of a sudden she's like, oh my God, we have to help him. And we we have to make people know about this disease. And like, blah. It's like, did you change characters throughout the course of this film? Well, yes and no. And and I agree with you. I do think that Judith is arguably the most interesting character. It's weird to say that it's not Jeff, but Jeff is literally introduced discovering that he is infected and then he just loses his mind. And the rest of the film is him just kind of attacking people like we mm-hmm. don't really understand what he's going through. He doesn't appear to have any friends except for a black co-worker who shows up twice in the movie. So Jeff is kind of like a non-entity. He's just the person who's driving a lot of the conflict, which means that most of the responsibility for shouldering the film falls on Steph, and she's doing the police investigatory stuff, and we have to deal with all of the other crap with her. But then, yeah, we have Judith, who is trying to argue that the public has a right to know, even though the police are really afraid it's going to cause a panic, and... I thought that that was a really interesting moral conundrum that unfortunately the movie is it's a little too interested in just like making it sensational and then moving past it because Judith is both right and wrong. Yeah, I one of my favorite things about Judith is she's like we we are introduced to Judith as she and her I guess boyfriend are listening on a new radio they just got and they mm-hmm. happen to come across the same channel that the police are on talking about Je- the eighth jabber they don't know his name yet um, right and she says like well this would be really good for me because I'm a really I, I I've only been a reporter for like a very short amount of time but then when she's doing her broadcast later she's mm-hmm. like make sure to point out and me a seasoned reporter who's been around for several years <laughs> 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 yeah, okay, so you're right. She she does seem to maybe go through a couple of edits or changes throughout the film. Uh, circling back, though, to mm-hmm. the point where you're like, wait, all of a sudden now she has compassion for Jeff. Yeah, I think the reason that we do see that shift in her is because he... He has a list, right? So he's making his way through the people that he feels has slighted him. So he texts the sex worker that he blames for infecting him. Mm -hmm. He goes after his boss. He randomly injects a couple of people on the street that he (gasps) runs into for no reason at all. The old lady. (laughs) Like, he basically runs past them and they both fall over like they've broken all the bones in their bodies. And he's like, (laughs) it's a a very odd scene. Mr. Magic has some choice line deliveries. And I think he says, um, I got AIDS, okay? AIDS! (laughs) Like three times in this movie. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, which again is the kind of like near camp potential that I expected a bit more of, but I don't yeah. know if it was they were trying to keep the performances in check because for the most part, I mean, these are not the best acting no performances here. These, you're these ever are not see. good performances. This is bad. I mean, but here's a, I don't think they're that bad though. I think they're actually okay. Like they're trying to give relatively naturalistic performances, and then every once in a while they become histrionic. Ooh, but it, it, no, see, it's not. It's not just like. It's God, it's like a bad porno to me. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad because, oh, it's like affecting my opinion of the film. Because, again, I'm Mm -hmm. walking into this expecting bad performances. Like, you know, this isn't like, I mean, I guess what, a 90s version of a 70s John Waters movie. (laughs) Maybe, but it doesn't even have the the fun sort of weirdness to it, right? No, I guess I just mean more so in the acting quality. um, Because I actually think I think John Waters is a bit of a better director. And granted, uh, Mr. Gadaris, I think, had many less resources to work with. But so many of the shots that he does are just like there's not a lot of coverage in this film Mm -mm. it's just a a master shot of a room and that's pretty much every scene of the film yeah to me that's very telling about how much money he probably Mm -hmm. did not have and just the the confines of shooting on location in los angeles willing to bet he didn't have any kind of shooting permit so it was probably like can we get in there can we get the shot and then can we get out And we're lucky enough that we have bedrooms and other rooms in people's houses that can double for a police station or a newsroom. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Uh, Oh, God. Is it um, Steph's? I was in her house or maybe it's an apartment, but I was like, what is this space? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a couple of very questionable spaces that you can tell have been retrofit for the production yeah um but, okay, but sorry uh, i keep trying to come back to this part where it's like why does judas character switch it's oh. because it, 
at one point, Jeff finally goes after her, which you you assume it's either going to be his boss or her is going to be the final person he tries to attack because mm-hmm. it's been building up to it. He gets rid of the boss earlier than I expected. Yeah, very much so. But I guess that's the one where it's like, oh, yeah, this makes sense. He would go after him. Because, and he goes after Judith because, mm-hmm. you know, she's doing these reports on him. And, and she says on the air, like, I hope you burn in hell for all this. And I'm like, what is his line? He's like, you just worked your way to the top of my list, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. So he he kind of goes after her when she's getting into her car and they end up having a full-blown conversation. And I think the reason her attitude shifts and she stops trying to get the police to, like, kill him or telling him that he should burn in hell is because she understands, oh, you're a person. You're yeah. not just a madman who's going around doing this. Like, And it kind of brings me back to what you talked about in terms of normalizing we have an obscure interpretation of like who gets infected with Mm -hmm. HIV, who ends up having AIDS and so on. And I think in this case, she thinks, oh, it's just this madman. He's on a rampage until she meets him and realizes, oh, you're a human being who is sick and you're acting out. It's not healthy. It's not safe. You're hurting other people. But she realizes the reaction should not be to murder this man or even like to hurt him because he's already hurting well so then what do you make i mean what do you make like, how what do you think of the conclusion of this film so we get you know the cops corner jeff and judith mm-hmm. is there trying to say like oh my god like don't don't kill him and then jeff runs forward the cops kill him mm-hmm. and then it's revealed that oh mm. the, <laughs> the dr white by the way <laughs> and, the, and the lab uh mishandled his file and he actually does not have aids this entire time he has not had aids Yeah, so this is definitely a kind of ironic twist of the knife that Mm -hmm. we're supposed to think, okay, I think it's the film's attempt to say, well, what would you do if you were put in this position? Like, how would you react? Would you go off the deep end? Would you do maybe not something quite like this? But, you know, you would have a very strong reaction. And shockingly enough, this does happen. I will say it's very unusual to have like a weird personal response to a film especially mm-hmm. one like la aids jabber yeah but my husband brian literally was in this position so he went in for random testing when he was single and mm-hmm. going on dates with various men and he got a false positive on oh. his hiv test and it took 32 hours for them to figure it out and call him so he had like called people he broke down crying Uh, he had to like take a sick day from work because he was like mentally unable to cope this was in the late 90s and he gave me permission to share this story on the air but he said it was like emotionally devastating and then he had to figure out oh my god no i don't actually have this and he said it was really, really traumatizing to think all of a sudden that your life is not just maybe going to be irreparably compromised, but you could actually suddenly die. Yeah, well, especially, I mean, you said it was the late 90s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like we didn't have prep. Yeah. We had cocktails and they would extend your life, but they didn't guarantee that you wouldn't still die. And we are fortunate. I mean, of course, it was actually what I found fascinating about this was like they're having conversations about, oh, like they, mm. they said there's going to be a vaccine like next year. And it's like, well, that doesn't happen. Um, yep. But obviously today, yes, like, contracting HIV is not a death sentence anymore. Mm-hmm. People with HIV live long, long, healthy lives. Um, they, yep. they will still have it. But, um, you know, working that way to that vaccine, maybe. I do think that that's maybe one of the reasons why I would tell people to watch this movie if they are at all interested in the concept and they want to see it for themselves. It's kind of startling to watch this movie in the time capsule of like 1994 at the end of the AIDS crisis, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. from this 2023 perspective, right? Because all of a sudden you're like, wow, this is not our reality anymore. You wouldn't need to have a response like Jeff because AIDS is not a death sentence anymore. Like, we're so far removed from this. And it's 30 years. Yeah, very much so. So, yeah, I I, 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 I think this is a fine movie. I mean, look, we're judging on a scale of what this kind mm. of movie mm-hmm. is. Uh, it, it was less, as I said, offensive than I thought it was going to be. So, again, I like that because I'm like, yeah, I'm not offended by this. Right. But I also think as an exploitation film, maybe it's not completely doing its job as an exploitation film. 
Yeah, it, it's sneaky. I think the title and the artwork is actually the most offensive, mm-hmm. sensational thing about it. And that very much feels like it was intended strictly for marketing and sales purposes. Like, 100%. how can I make something that will guarantee catch people's eye so that I can make some money off of this? Yep. And then the film itself is actually kind of different from what you're promised. So if you are going in looking for like ultra sleazy, really offensive, this movie is not going to do it for you. It's just a surprisingly kind of weird little kooky thriller with some okay-ish performances and yeah, like super, super low budget. Very much so. Um, and I actually, um, before we close it, I actually wanted to just say, you know, if uh, you have any questions or need resources about HIV, the National Institute of Health's HIV Info hotline is 1-800-HIV-0440. So. Nice. Um, but yeah, uh, solid film. Uh, glad I watched it. And now I own this Blu-ray. So <laughs> there we go. Honestly, the the art is so fucking good. Like it is. I feel like I keep talking about it. But if you have not searched out, there's two different covers. There's like the cover of the Blu-ray and then there's the actual slip case cover. Mm-hmm. And they're both really, really good. <laughs> yeah, very, very much so. And I think uh, we didn't get these, but some of the special editions of this Blu-ray actually were shipped with uh, faux syringes. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that's See, good that's bad. offensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably the most offensive part of the movie. Um, okay, everyone. But yeah, so yeah, that's LA AIDS Jabber. Please uh, go to uh, go to Visual Vengeance's website or Wild Eye Releasing and find this Blu-ray if you really want to seek it out. If you're interested, I mean, there's a, a wealth of special features on the disc. If you're just interested in the film, you don't necessarily want to pay for the, the fancy Blu-ray. I do believe it's also free on Tubi. Oh, that's highly possible, yeah. Um, but again, if you if you care about it, good Blu-ray release. Honestly, yeah. But yeah, okay, everyone. So uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with us, please reach us on Twitter and Instagram at HorrorQueers. Shoot us an email at HorrorQueers at gmail.com. Find us on Letterboxd to keep track of all the films we've covered. Uh, go watch our YouTube videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to chat with other listeners, please join our Facebook Horror Queers group. If you love us, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Or support us by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash horrorqueers. Uh, we're in 2023 now, so this Ooh. month we've got episodes on the horror anthology sequel Scare Package 2, Rad Chad's Revenge. Netflix's Edgar Allan Poe murder mystery The Pale Blue Eye. Skinner Rink, the movie that had pirates showing their asses everywhere, and Megan, the film whose trailer took the world by storm last year. And of course, for our monthly audio commentary, we've got on Cloverfield in honor of its 15th anniversary. Oh my god, so old. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I remember seeing that shit in theaters, but uh, right? yes. <laughs> All those people walking out from their motion sickness, too. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. <sighs> okay, everyone, well, until next time, we can cross out L.A. AIDS Jabber. Indeed, and cross out horror queers. Ah, Atlas Avenue, a long stretch of road that encompasses everything the city of Kennet Heights has to offer. Neon lights, traffic, crime, the hustle and bustle of everyday life, and the craziest of characters. My office was above it all. My name is James Locke, and I'm a P.I. Hello, Mr. J. How the hell you doing today? Good, Edith. Nearly every year I have a new case. New people to meet, new clues to discover, and new problems to solve. But I do it the old-fashioned way. No technology. Nothing post-1950. Hell, I don't even listen to podcasts, but you should. Atlas Avenue Beat is a spoof of the film noir genre with goofy characters, tons of wordplay, and nonstop raunchy humor. There's also three whole seasons out right now with more on the way. Just search for Atlas Avenue Beat wherever you listen to podcasts or visit us online at bloody.fm.